Welcome to the Workshop Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and today joining me is, I was going to say the better half, but arguably just one of the halves of the Oak and Steel Podcast. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to offend the other half, but, but one of the halves of the Oak and Steel Podcast, Mr. Michael Cleary. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on and, and, uh, coming on at a time schedule that's probably slightly inconvenient for you, but better for me, maybe. We we may or may not have a live studio audience today, but that's all right. Are they going to laugh at you when you say something embarrassing, or, uh, or shall I just cue up a laugh track? I think you might have to cue that in, but I think we're, I'm only being half paid attention to, so that's okay. Maybe there's one ear on, on the, uh, the Mounds V Roaster studio over here. Yeah, so I, had a, I was wondering about that. How long have you been in the coffee business? So I, I was a elementary teacher for nine years, and I kind of started sprinkling in the coffee piece towards the end of my time as a educator. And so I started the business in 2019, and I learned from a local kind of coffee legend around here, and he he's actually the one that brought me into doing the the roaster sales that we sell we sell roasters out of Italy and the he his famous words to me were like Michael you're gonna have to learn how to roast and I his name is Victor uh that then if you've if anybody's familiar with the Madison Wisconsin area uh, Victor Allen uh coffee was a very it, it's still actually produced uh it's private labeled under a different company now and he yeah he um he Victor has since passed away but he started us on this business with with the IMF roasters out of Italy. And uh, yeah, he, he just kind of gave me the business about that. I need to learn to roast and I kind of refuted it and didn't really wasn't, I wasn't going to do it. And and then I kind of got hooked on it and started doing that. And I've been going pretty strong and the businesses kind of gained traction year after year. And COVID actually, believe it or not, was very beneficial for my business uh, as everyone was trying to support local. And it kept a uh, it kept me going pretty quick, uh, in, and I needed to get up to speed pretty fast with with my roasting uh, once the orders started rolling in. That's, that's that is the kind of the catch twenty two of COVID. It was very beneficial to a lot of local businesses, but then a lot of local businesses totally got screwed too. Is yeah. one of those like I think I think what? a lot of people started revving up like, oh, we need to we need to have all these employees, or we need to have you know X Y Z to make sure that we're we're able to produce, but then. You know, I definitely saw a tick back in 2022 and then even maybe like a little bit more of a, a tick back in 2023. It seems like it's kind of leveled out at this point. Um, so, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any, it, you know, any less reverberations from COVID, if, if you will. Yeah. So, so is teaching elementary school, is that what drove you mad? I, I really enjoyed it. And I would say I would still have been a teacher. I would still be in education if it wasn't for the, I don't know, there's just so much red tape that you maybe as a parent, you don't see uh, that your, your kids go through, but the teachers are not only responsible for, you know, making sure that the education is taking place, but then there's just like jump through hoop after hoop after hoop. And I don't know, that wore me out. And I was like, I, I kind of felt. I want to do something where my work, my effort is uh, proportional to, you know, the outcomes that I want to see, you know, just because Johnny doesn't give a crap about school, excuse my language, but a, uh, <laughs> just because he doesn't care about school, you know, I, that shouldn't be tied to me as an educator. And there was just, I didn't find a lot of merit in the tying of test scores to kids and then, then appropriating that to like your recognition as a teacher if you will yeah I, I i know exactly what you're talking about because my wife's a teacher and so yeah, that's uh which which is ironic that we're homeschooling our kids but but yeah it's, you're right there's so much red tape and there's so many the the problem that we had is is uh, you know we've talked about our son having autism right and he's typically when you hear the the uh, oh, he's got autism. You think of the drooling kid in the corner who's making weird noises, right? But he's a level he's level one. And so unless you know he has autism, you don't know he has autism until you start watching him for a bit. And then you're like, ah, there's something off about this kid. But anyway, the the problem that we encountered is here we have this boy that's 
So one of the problems we encountered was was that because he's not a standout um, problem, he just gets shuffled into the back because understandably one teacher doesn't have time to individually teach 28, 30 different kids. But then, but then because he's not a problem child, there isn't any extra resources allocated to him. And so then he just gets further and further and further behind and gets left behind. And so then when we had our second child, he was in grade two at the time. And we pulled him out of school because we went in for a parent-teacher interview. And the the teacher, you know, he talk, talking us through his report card. And then the boy screwing around. So I say, okay, go, go over there. Go read a book. And so he goes and sits down and he starts reading a book. And, and I quote the teacher, oh, I didn't know he could read. Oh, my goodness. He's like, are, are, you, are you kidding me? That's like literally his thing. He, he's been able to read since he, before he went to kindergarten. Sure. Like, how do you not know he can read? What have you been doing? <laughs> anyway, so we, we were like, well, we have a teacher in the house at home who's not working right now. Why are we sending him to school? Sure. And then spending eight hours teaching him what he should have learned at school. And anyway, so we pulled him out of school and homeschooled him for a couple of years and then put him back into school the year before COVID. And then that, yeah, you know, that happened. And so now, yeah, it's it's just like okay, he's public, the public school system is going to fail him, and so we pulled him out. Sure. sure. But now, now we now we're this new school year. We're heading into a really weird situation. Um. So my wife is she's she's just started her master's in special education and autism, and uh, she just started. She just signed a contract to start teaching at a local. Are, are you familiar with who Hutterites are at all? No, I'm not. Uh, you know the Mennonites. Yes. So, so the Mennonites, Hutterites, Amish, all of those, all of those groups of people are originally like a German Dukabors, I think is what they were called, a religious group, right? Lots of persecution came to the New World to establish a new their own thing. And so these, these groups of people, they're all kind of the same religious roots with a few different kind of variations. Obviously the Amish are very strict into the technology stuff and the Mennonites are not quite as strict and a lot more diverse, but the, the Hutterites, they're, they're farmers and they're communal people. So they have, they have colonies of, you know, 50 people, 100 people that run a big farm. And anyway, they have on-site schools. And so my wife just got hired to teach at the local Hutterite colony to us, which is like five minutes from our house, which is kind of nice. Sure. But then as a part of that contract, we're like, well, we're homeschooling our kids. And so they were like, well, you can come and bring your kids to our school. <laughs> and so, so we're going to be going into this weird situation there where we're kind of homeschooling our kids in a one-room school with a bunch of other kids. Sure, I hear you. Anyway, so it'll be an interesting uh, be an interesting next couple of years and see how that goes. Because what, what grade is he in currently? So he's technically grade 8. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we ran him through a bunch of... Got him officially assessed with stuff in, back in February and and he's like the 99.9th percentile for reading comprehension and the fourth percentile for writing. That's my experience usually as well with, with kids that, um, that are identified as autistic or, you know, with autism. That they, yeah, are, so they, they this... love to read. The, I mean, the, the thing I always heard was if you've met one child or one person with autism, then you've met one person with autism. They're not the same. It's, 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 yeah. But I could say that more often than not, they did not like to write. Yeah. And that's, that's something actually just, just ran across here recently. Um, there's a lot of research that's coming out currently that a lot of these neurodiversity 
uh, problems like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, all of them are, are uh, you familiar with the brain structures? You got your, your neocortex and then your brain stem and your cerebellum. Mm -hmm. So the cerebellum, the cerebellum is, is your motor control unit basically. Right. And, and one of the things that it, it, it does is it's a, it's an automator of processes. So, you know, like in sports, how, how people, they talk about, um, if you're thinking about it, you're going to do it wrong. Sure. So you, you practice and you practice and you practice. And what you're essentially doing is you're, you're tra training your cerebellum to automate those processes. And so then you, you can do the action without thinking. And so with neurodiversities, the cerebellum is, is becoming dysfunctional and it's not able to automate certain things that, that normal people can do, neurotypical mm. people can do. And so instead of, instead of, while, while talking about forming habits or breaking habits, right? Uh, you, where, where when, when a neurotypical person develops a habit, they, they do it without thinking, like brushing your teeth, for example, right? You walk into the, you walk into the bathroom, it's nighttime. So that's, to, to your point, that's a cue. Uh, I got my pajamas on. There's another cue. Um, whatever other cues are in your head that form those habits. You then, you then go into the action that's associated with that and you brush your teeth and you think about whatever you're thinking about while you're brushing your teeth and then you go on about your life. Uh, when you're, when you're unable to use your cerebellum to automate those processes, every single time you do that thing that you have to do, it's a conscious decision and it's a conscious choice and you have to think about it. And so it's very, that's, that's one of the things, one of the theories behind autism, at least, is, is that, that because you have to think about so much, it just becomes overwhelming and then you shut down. Sure. But. Anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. What was, what, what were, well, I think you were, I mean, if I, I mean, we were discussing the, just, you know, some of maybe the differences that we would oh. see, um, but yeah. to, I kind of heard you cue in on the, the habit uh, conversation. And I think you, I don't know that your listeners necessarily know this, but you and I have chatted, you know, through uh, Instagram direct messages and all of that. And I had just, you had, I think it was your last episode or maybe yeah. the one before you had talked about changing a habit, right? Or some, something yeah. along the lines of changing a, ha a habit. And uh, I kind of pushed back on a little bit of it Of from my perspective. I had done some reading of a book called uh, The Power of Habit. And in that book, it, it alludes to some of the things that you're saying. And uh, it just, you know, you have a cue of, you know, like it's nighttime, so I need to do this. And then, you know, you want to have a reward. Um, and I, I'm trying to, I should have pulled up my notes here, but the other the other piece to the puzzle that I thought was really important is just to to literally say it out loud to family and friends to kind of help you hold hold you accountable to your goal and tr to that you're trying to attain and and uh yeah i was I was appreciative of of that i I think I would love to hear you talk even more about that and elaborate even more of on goal setting and habits and uh, and honestly i'm I'm hoping I can work this in with you today at some point but um, just the power of motivation and like, what does motivation, how does it play a factor in, you know, a, a person inside their brain? And I guess, um, why do, why are some people motivated more intrinsically and some were more motivated, you know, through, um, fiscally, I guess, if you will, but I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more on your take from some of that. If, uh, if you have some time to dive into that for me. Uh, so why why people are motivated and not motivated uh, who, who's the author of the power of habits i i know i've read it but i don't remember who wrote it if you don't mind me type here i'm gonna mute my mic while you're while you're if you want to start in and i'll dive in on a second here so intrinsic and ext extrinsic motivation are really really important factors in um why people do things right uh, so a book that I was going to recommend for you, then if you're, if, if you're, you're obviously into reading books and listening to books and you're a parent, look up, have you ever heard of punished by rewards? I have not. Okay. Uh, so the author is Elfie Cohn. I'll, 
I'll, the books that we talk about, I'm, I'll, I will drop in the, in the links to the description for people to look at. Uh, but a book that I recommend that just about everybody in the world reads, parenting or just employers or whatever, would be punished by rewards. And it talks about how, uh, so Alfie Cohn, he's a, he's an educational researcher, but that's where his, his basis is. But he talks a lot about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And the other, the other good book would be, um, oh shoot, uh, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. I might have read that one. It's, it's a fairly popular book, um. So, so going back to motivation and punished by rewards. So anytime you're motivated by an extrinsic motivator, I guess maybe that's where we should start. Extrinsic versus in, intrinsic. Extrinsic is you're motivated to do something for some external gain or somebody's going to give you something. And, and it can be, so you can have a negative extrinsic reward or an extrinsic motivator. So somebody's going to punish you if you don't do the thing. Or you can have a positive extrinsic motivator. For example, I'm going to pay you to do this thing, right? Uh, an, in, an intrinsic motivation is, is I'm motivated to do this thing because I want to do it. So for whatever whatever internal joy that you get. And that's where, where you see people you know, in our sphere, in the maker sphere that, that don't want to turn their hobby into employment because it ruins it for them. Right. And that's one of the reasons why is because you're doing the thing because you love doing the thing. And, and suddenly if there's some sort of extrinsic thing coming in, it, it's going to inherently demotivate you. And so with, with LT Cones, research that he talks about with being punished by rewards you have all these motivational systems that that exist you know like you, you remember as a kid like the pizza party if you read 40 books or whatever uh time and time and time again research has shown that those are actually negative in the long run because what happens is you you take you take something that you want the person to do like reading's a good thing, but then you tie it to a reward. And so then the thing itself doesn't have value. The reward has the value, right? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. And so that's where that's where you you then the, the other thing that then then happens is people don't look for challenging things, they look for easy things to do. And so you get the kid like I, I, I enjoyed reading as a kid. The first time I read through The Lord of the Rings, I was in like grade three, I think, maybe grade four, something like that. And so I just wanted to read the book. And so for these this pizza party challenge, I'm like, well, I have one book that's whatever it is, 900 pages or 2,000 pages, something like that. And, and I didn't want to read it because I wasn't going to get a reward because I had one book. Whereas everybody else was, you know, powering through Dr. Seuss or, or right. whatever. Right. And so that kind of highlights what happens when you're, when you're reward motivated. Um, fortunately for me, I read the book and, uh, and my teacher gave me credits for the number of pages I've read. Well, one would hope, right? Yeah. One would hope, but often that doesn't happen. And, uh, but then. There's there's other research kind of tying into Carol Dweck's book about growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. You have, you've heard of those terms before? Yes. Yep. Um, so, yeah, growth mindset is is when a problem comes, this is a challenge I can overcome, basically, whereas a fixed mindset is my my abilities are what my abilities are. And so there was a couple studies there's been a f multiple studies now at this point where, where they take like a group of children and, and put them into a, a, an environment and give them like some puzzles, right? Varying degrees of difficulty on these puzzles. A and you, you go through these puzzles and the kids are divided into two groups of 
one where where they're given given praise following these puzzles and go oh wow you're really smart you you did a good job because you're smart yeah. and then the other group they go wow you did a good job because you worked really hard and then they're then they're the follow up study is then watch what these kids do and and a massive proportion of the kids who are told they're smart don't do harder puzzles or or whatever that harder task is they they go to the simple things and they go to they go to i'm smart therefore if this is hard for me it's beyond my abilities whereas the kids who are told you worked hard have a growth mindset and they go well this is hard and so they they almost always like 90% of the time will outperform the other kids they'll they'll stick to the difficult puzzles longer they'll they'll choose the more difficult things voluntarily and yeah it's it's, it's just a whole thing i've, and so, I've also well, in, it was either in the the power of, so the, the book that i was referring to is called the power of habit and it was uh it's charles duhigg i believe d u h i g g and it's either in his book and it might have been and i also read another book called outliers are you familiar with outliers I've read Outliers, yeah. I can't remember which one it was in, um, but they were referring to your – and I might be mixed. I, there's been – I've read a few books this year, so I'm kind of – they're all mushed in my head right now. But um, your brain only has so much like, like follow-through, um, so much – so here, here's the here was the study. Um, there's two groups. Uh, one group is told you need to think about that you're not going to eat this cookie or something like that, and the other group is told you're not going to eat these beets. Something along those lines of like one group, it's it's super easy. Like I don't, I'm, I don't care if I don't eat the beets. The other group, like man, I kind of want the cookies. Like I really want the cookies. Then they give them a task after the fact. And they, the folks that were having, that had to, don't think about the cookies, don't think about, don't even think about eating those cookies. They had, they were more irritable. They gave up faster where if you were in the group that was like, don't think about the beats, then they were, they had more a bandwidth, if you will, the ability to, 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 you know, fight through the adversity that they were given. And I thought that was really interesting because in my head, I had it, re I had it reversed. If I was if I was so capable of saying I'm not going to eat the cookie, then I can do any puzzle that is put in front of me. But it's it wasn't that way. So it's interesting that you can you can use up um, your I don't know your mental strength, if you will. Yeah, the the way I like to describe it to people when I'm talking about stuff like this is is you have you have a bucket, basically, right of of ability to, for the day like you have a certain amount of reserve for the day and and all of the time anytime that you have to maintain something into your head especially some sort of mental like like uh some sort of executive function control so you're, you're you have to think about how you're what you're doing you're using up some of that reserve and so the more the more self-control that you have to put into something the more difficult and the more and the more arduous it is and the less reserve you have when you actually need self control. And that's where um when you're I forget I forget where might have been one of the books that you've suggested, The Power of Habit. Might might be somebody else, but anyway, one of the ways when you're trying to develop a habit, what you need to do is you need to put systems into place to make the habit easier. So a good example is, you know, like probably most of us have a bad habit of the first thing you do in the morning is pick up and you look at your phone, right? And and if you want to do something else, then what you need to do before you go to bed, like let's say let's say you want to write a list of things to do in the morning instead of picking up your phone. You before you go to bed, you need to put the phone down and then you need to put the book on top of the phone. And so the first thing that you have to do is you have to consciously choose to not do the thing that you want to do to get to the thing that you're going to mindlessly do. 
right? And so lots of, to your, to your point of, of cues and stuff and developing habits, that's, that's what you need to do is you need to, you need to think in advance and, and put a system in place to prevent those cues from happening or, or to replace them with different cues. But, but then going to the punished by rewards, you also need to avoid like, like the people who fad diets are a really good example of this. The people who go out and they, they, uh, their, their goal is to fit into their swimsuit or, or look good for the wedding or whatever it is. Right. But then they, well, you have to reward yourself with the treat day at the end of the week or whatever. Those people almost always do do the the weight loss, weight gain, weight loss, weight gain cycle because the the value the the the, the diet is a punishment, and the reward is there's no intrinsic mo- motivation to stay on the diet, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's almost as if you're. Yeah, you're living for the treat the treat day. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people a lot of people do and that's why that's why you read stuff that oh, diets are diets are crap. Diet, you know, diets don't work. Diets diets do work. The, it's true. They they all 90% of the diets that you pick are going to work. But but the reason they they fail is not because the diet sucks. It's because the reason that you're doing the diet sucks, basically. Yeah. So I have a question for you, and I don't know if you'll let me, if you'll allow me to to add a pivot here. You're the host, so I don't know if you're allowed if you if I can do a Ross Geller pivot. No, is that all right. Is, yeah, that's totally fine. I okay. I have no agenda. Okay. So one of the things that. Uh, when you're an, ed- an educator, there's prof- uh, professional development, right? They're they're always trying to put something in front of you to kind of help you want to grow as an educator. One of the yeah. um, pieces that my principal put in front of us was the idea that as a as a staff, everybody is a compass point. You're a north, a south, an east, or a west. Are you familiar with this at all? Vaguely, not really, not really much, but I have heard that before. Yeah. So nor- a North Compass Point person is going to be your go-getters. I don't need to worry about a plan. I'm going to do it. And then if it didn't work, I'll recalibrate and I'll try again. Conversely, the other end of that is a South where they can't move forward. This is my wife, by the way, and I'm a North. It's funny how that works. Uh, they can't move forward and they, until they know everyone's feelings. And how is this going to impact everyone emotionally? Um, and I, I get the next two confused. Um, I believe East are their list makers. They want to know the, or no, I'm sorry, that's West, I believe. East are big picture. They want to know, you know, kind of the whole picture of why are we doing this? You know, all of that, where the, I believe it's the West. They want to make a list of everything and have all the details scheduled out. Um, I want to know, do you think that most, most makers are, where do you think they fall on on a compass rose and why i think everybody i think it's probably even distribution honestly because myself for example i i would say i'm like you i would be the north i i just jump in figure it out let's do this crap get it over with get it done right i also hate following plans like i i when i build when I build furniture, if I bought a plan, it's it's purely for the I don't know how they did that one little part. And and I've only I've only bought like two plans, I think, my entire life for and and, and I don't think I followed either one of them. But uh but then on the other end of that spectrum I have friends who they have never built anything off plan. And and I would say they're probably technically no they they are technically more accomplished than i am as far as their skill level goes but i would if if they were if we were put into a room with each other and given a pile of boards to build something 
I would say, hands down, I'm going to do a better job of building something, right? Because they don't have a plan. Uh, and so then, then there's the people who are motivated to build the thing because they want, because they see the end product and they don't have the, don't, don't care how they get there. Right. And then there's the other people who enjoy the process of building. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And and where I was going with this is let's correlate, if we can, let's correlate. If we, how does the compass rose play into intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation? And do you think there's any correlation? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, so there probably the reason, is the reason I say this is because I th- would think more and, and this maybe I'm biased. I would think more Norths are going to be intrinsically motivated people. That's what I was going to say too. Um, because I w- I would think if you're if you're let's jump in head first and and find out what happens. You're not. I would say you're less afraid of consequences. Whereas if you're hesitant to to proceed then you'd be you'd be more concerned about consequences and and be more extrinsically motivated or extrinsically looking at what's going on but but then you could probably think of examples of the opposite as well but well cuz I mean, my wife's south being... right you know so my wife's south that doesn't mean she's not motivated she she or intrinsically motivated i i think you know, she's also, she's also an educator and I, she works her tail off. She is like one of the hardest working teachers that there, that there are, in my opinion. And I just, I think it's interesting. I I just wanted to see if you could pinpoint a correlation and if there, if where the, where intrinsic motivation comes from in that, like, if you look at under, under that lens. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I would, I would say, I would say they're probably two different constructs. Um, but, but at the same time, I would say, I would still probably say that people who are jumping into things would be more extrinsically motivated. So I would say it's probably like a correlation versus causation thing, Mm -hmm. right? Like things can definitely be correlated. Like, um, for listeners who don't, I mean, I'm assuming you know what correlation and causation are, right? But, um, for people who may not know what what the difference is 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 you can have you can have things that are correlated with each other that for example ice cream and shark attacks i ice cream consumption and shark attacks have almost the exact same coral distribution curve so when ice cream sales go up shark attacks go up hand in hand the 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 curve is almost the same does that mean they cause each other absolutely not but but they are very very correlated um and so i i would in the case of like your 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 compass point i would say there's probably a lot of correlation maybe not causation um there's there's the thing is is there's lots of there's lots of different theories about how things work and they all the hell kind of step on each other's toes but but going back to like like the autism thing you know autism is a spectrum disorder and so like you said you know you've met one autistic kid you've met one autistic kid there are some some things that that kind of correlate over over lots of them but at the same time there's a big spectrum and people are a big spectrum as well. And, and that's where a few, a few episodes ago, I, I made the claim that there is no such thing as, as neurodivergent. Everybody is essentially neurodivergent. It's just, where are you on that bell bell curve? What we call is what we call neurotypical is, is this, two standard deviations from the center, which covers 95% of the population or, or 80, what are the deviations? I forget what they are now, but you know, you know what I mean? Like the bulk of everybody is kind of similar, but even then you still have this spread of people who, who do this and this and nobody's the same. But, yeah. 
Well, and the answer so, is I don't know. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's like it's probably a like um, an answer that is a it's always on the move, right? Like it's probably not you can't necessarily pin it, and it probably depends on who you are as a person. You know, I I get to, I'm very lucky working with Matt on our show Open Steel because I get to see somebody who is very intrinsically motivated. He already has a full time job and he works his tail off, and he but again he doesn't necessarily meet that you know he's doing it for money and all of a sudden it's not his passion anymore he still loves it he's still i'm sure there's days where he 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 wishes he wasn't there till two in the morning or something like that because he's got a deadline but i i can guarantee you that guy loves doing what he does and you can see it in his work yeah and and i think that's that's one of those things where it's really important to distinguish between between like extrinsic and intrinsic motivations like there's there's people who work really really hard but choose not to when they don't have to then whereas yeah if you are intrinsically motivated to do something you're more likely to spend those oh crap i gotta i gotta get this done by the end of the day but i'm still going to come in and do it again tomorrow um but that that's another another factor i think that plays into people who who want to jump ship from their their day job and and make it on their own as a you know like i have a stable job as a teacher and now i'm going to go roast coffee instead right you you know you you gotta too many people have the pie in the sky dream of oh my life's going to be wonderful when i pursue my passion there's going to still be times when you're two o'clock in the morning wondering why you did this you know like, right. there, there's going to be those times where this sucks. Why did I do this? I left my stable job. But so if you're if you're if you're pursuing turning your hobby into something that you want to do for a job, you have to be conscious of that that you're that you're doing this because you love this and and it's going to be great to be able to do this as a living versus the people who are holy crap i can make a hundred bucks a cutting board or i can make a hundred bucks a forged you know a a forged bottle opener or whatever it happens to be that they make right Right. yeah we talk a lot about that Uh, i mean maybe it's just matt and my conversations off air um but just that idea of passive income and and how to make it so that you don't have to work so hard or ways to automate things so that you can um, do more things at once and try to, and try to be um, improve your lead times or what, what not. That's a lot of the discussions we have on Oak and Steel. We do kind of dive down that rabbit hole of how do you run your business more efficiently? Yeah. And, and actually I've, <clears throat> to be honest, I binged your last like four episodes on the trip here coming down yesterday because I was driving for ten hours. So, so I listened to them all yesterday. <laughs> so we're fresh in your head. Yep. And and now that is actually a trend that I noticed that you guys do talk about that a lot. And and something that I was, um, that I'm interested in myself is is how do you get to the point of passive income or or whatever the case is. Um, because I, I'm, I'm been self-employed for 11 years now and, and my business to one of your recent episodes here, my business has always been dependent on me being there. And, and if I'm not there, it's not making any money. And so, so how do you how do you get to the point where you're making money without being there? But how do you also not, not get pulled into four or five different directions? Because you mentioned, you mentioned on a recent episode there where you have like two or three different LLCs going on. Right. And, and I've been in that same position. I've had, I've had three different businesses going at the same time or four different businesses at one point, I think. And then, and then, through circumstances i get rid of one or sell sell something and and then i'm in a position of of well this is great just having one thing to focus on and and i'm i struggle with the i struggle with the 
uh, should you do a bunch of things? Should you be a jack of all trades or a master of one? Right. And, and probably because of some undiagnosed ADHD, I'd rather be a jack of all trades. But the trade off to that is you're never going to be an expert. And it's, it's the experts that make the money on the one thing. Right. Can, well, can I push back? Because I think a little bit, if you don't mind, I, I think you are actually very well set up for passive income. Your passive income, and again, I don't, I don't necessarily know your the days, the ins and outs of your days, but I feel like between if you could somehow put out articles or or a book for for that matter, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, what level of comfort that it is to you. I mean, those things sell on their own off to the side and you're not you're you don't need to be present for that um i i think you are so smart and artic you articulate yourself so well that i i think someone if you could share your knowledge about the brain and, and i know that like i'm guessing it's a pretty flooded market if you will like i'm there's probably a lot of folks that do that but i i think you you have a really good knack for relating to people having a an in-depth conversation and making it so people can understand things so if if i was looking for passive income and i was andrew hatch i would be looking to write a book is that a thought well if 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 i could share if i could show you my uh if i could do a screen share right now i have i have a folder on my desktop that is my creative writing folder sure and there's the, again, going back to the undiagnosed ADHD. So my, uh, uh, so I'm on I'm on disability currently, right, because of my hands, and and I've found that maybe this is too personal to share. I'll I'll blur this out so nobody can see what's happening on this audio podcast. <laughs> but I'll stand in I'll, I'll stand in the shower and have a hot shower running on my shoulders and on my arms in the morning, and and that's what gets me functional for the day like when i wake up in the morning i have a hard time straightening my hands out and so so standing in the hot shower letting it run relax my muscles blah 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 that's what gets me going in the day and so i what i end up doing is i end up standing there and i end up thinking and and it'll pop into my head like this is how this should be phrased um for for example, maybe I'll just read one right now, and and then I can get some feedback on this. Yeah. Okay. So people people on the uh, people on the podcast, feel free to actually might even be open. Oh, it is open. Uh, this was my thought this morning, and and uh, going to expand this into an article at some point that I'm going to try to publish with a couple of different magazines. So the confusion about goals of treatment and diagnosis. In my interactions with people, as both a parent and as a professional, I often encounter a common misperception about treatment and diagnosis of neurodiversities. Often the treatment especially, often with treatment especially, there is an assumption that we are going to cure the problem. Let's take a step back and look at it from a different angle. Let's assume that instead of having autism, your child has auto mechanic instead. Unfortunately, in a world full of woodworkers, someone with mechanics tools is going to struggle with everyday tasks. Fortunately, our world needs more than just woodworkers. Our, need, our world needs a vast array of different people with different tools to function. Diagnosis is the first step in the process of finding out which skill set your child has. Treatment is the process through which the tools are discovered, practiced, and hopefully perfected. So that was my uh, that was my shower pondering this morning. And so usually what I'll do is I'll jump out and I'll I'll quickly sometimes I'll type that down or 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 I'll think oh I should write that down and I'll do that later and then I forget. <laughs> but I have I have a good few dozen of those kind of primers sitting there, and so that is one of my goals. But uh, one of my problems is you know the incessant doom scroll. Mm. But. No, that 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 was really I, I, that was great. I, I that's exactly what I would have expected that you could produce because I I feel like just my with my interactions with you and what I've seen from you on social media, I've I've just thought you have such a knack for this, and I really do hope you kind of that you continue to build on that and to a point where you feel good about it. And I I mean, 
it, your writing is fantastic. I if but if it would make your life easier, a way to problem solve is to get a ghostwriter that could help kind of fill in. And like I think most of the time, ghostwriters are used for people that are like maybe like the Arnold the Arnold Schwarzeneggers that are writing a book and maybe need yeah. a little guidance, you know. <laughs> so I but I I think you you would do a phenomenal job if you could put something out there. And I and yeah. Well, I I make this claim. I make this claim occasionally because, uh, so, so my, my undergrad, I have a bachelor's of behavioral neuroscience and I was initially going to do my master's and my PhD. And so my second half of my undergrad was a very research focused thing. And so in my undergrad alone, I, I had a couple classes where I wrote, I wrote two or three page papers every single week. And so I've, I, I make the claim that I've probably written four or five thousand pages already. That's wild, yeah. But because I have, yeah, I have my undergrad, and then I have my my chiropractic degree, and that's a four year degree, and then I didn't finish my master's of functional medicine. I kind of withdrew after year two of three on that, just because of business and stuff. And then now I'm working on this degree and, and I have a, a diplomat in environmental medicine as well. And so, so I've written a lot and I'm very, very comfortable with writing, but, but then there's that ADHD of I'll get that idea down and then oh, I'll come back to that and then never do. I also have, I also have a creative writing story just like, just like a, a novel story that's sitting on my computer here and it's like 20 or 30 pages at this point and every once in a while i'll get the bug and i'll I'll write a bunch and then it'll sit for another six months and so when my when i die my kids can open up my computer and then that's their retirement fund <laughs> is they can just publish all the stuff yeah. that i have written on my book on right. my laptop the books the books of the books of hatch yeah exactly but uh, yeah, so that is something that I have thought about, but it, it's also one of those things where I'm like going, going back to that, like, should you just focus on, should, should you pay somebody who's an expert on something to do the thing? Like, should you pay a ghostwriter, for example, to write your book, your autobiography? Uh, you know, if you're, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or whatever other celebrity you choose, if you have a hundred million people in your audience whatever your audience is, there's going to be a subset of those people who are going to buy whatever crap you promote. And so you can pay, you, you can guarantee that you can pay this guy $50,000 to ghostwrite your book or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is. And then you can recoup on your investment. Uh, but then, and so then as a person like myself, I'm, I'm struggling with the, I definitely can't justify paying somebody to do it just because I know I'm going to get paid back. Mm -hmm. So therefore I have to do it myself, but should I do it myself? Are my, are my focus, is my focus better placed somewhere else? Um, another couple of good books to read. Uh, do you know who Greg McKe Greg McEwen is? You ever heard of him? No, I have or not. He has an excellent podcast. That's, it's one of those ones that I recommend people listen to. Uh, Greg McEwen, he wrote a book called Essentialism, and it's basically the power of saying no. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's uh, we often we often get trapped into the into the feeling that success is saying yes to everything and taking all the opportunities that come along, and that does work for some people. But sometimes what's better is actually to say no, and and focus on what you're actually good at or, or your actual passion. But then, then to your most recent podcast there that I, I listened to, and then I posted the, the survivorship okay. bias, right? You got all of these people that, Oh, just jump in and follow your passion and you'll be successful. Your, your survivorship bias says that we ignore the hundreds of thousands of people that we haven't heard of and don't know anything about who jumped in and followed their passion 
and it turns out that people don't want hand knitted dog mittens or whatever it happens to <laughs> right, be, right? Right. It's like there's and so you get this this well, this rich and successful person jumped in and now they're successful because they followed their passion. Well, it turns out that their passion happened to be a whole lot of other people's passion as well. But anyway. No, I, I agree. Yeah, I and and you always you hear the uh, the, the, I don't know if this, this is the right way to say it or not, but like the rags to riches stories and all of that. And like, you know, I came from nothing and, and was able to do this. And I, I think there's something to be said for that. And I think that there's, that gives people that are intrinsically motivated, um, or I guess maybe they're not truly intrinsically motivated. Maybe they're more extrinsically, but it gives them something to shoot for, or at least a North star to go for and saying, at least if they can do it, I can find a way to, you know, navigate this to no matter where my circumstances are. And I think, so I, I do think those stories are important, but I agree with you. There's sometimes the, the thought that everybody can do this is not realistic. Yeah. Well, and, and did, did you read, did you read the, uh, the, the survivorship bias thing that I sent? Or... I zipped through it. I just, because I okay. was, I was looking, I was jumping into work today and I was like, I'll look through it just so we can touch base on it, but I get the premise of it. Uh, so do you know where that came from? Did did it talk in the article that I, I? I don't know if it if it mentioned it there. So survivorship bias is originally from uh, from World War II, and so what what it um, what it was is the, is they hired this this consultant to figure out what they could do to in, in increase the survivability in in the. Uh, the bombers going over over Germany, right? And so what they would do is they would get these planes back and they would look at where all the bullet holes were. And they go, oh, look at all these bullet holes. We need to improve the armor in these places. And and the uh, the consultant that they hired, or maybe it was somebody working with them, I don't remember the exact story now, but... They ended up saying, wait a minute, these planes here are all shot to heck and gone, and they're still flying. And you notice that there's no bullet holes in these areas, so maybe we're making the assumption that that this is the area with no bullet holes, this is the vital area that we need to protect more of, right? And so it turns out that that's the case, is if you can still fly full of bullet holes, then why would you bother putting armor there? Right. Put armor where there are no bullet holes and the plane comes back. Because obviously if there's a bullet hole that goes through there and the plane crashes, that's what you want to protect. Right. And so that's where the whole survivorship bias comes from, is that that looking at bomber planes. But it, it, it's very applicable everywhere else, though. Like like we said, is is all of these rags to riches stories. There's so there there are lots of rags to riches stories, but then then you kind of dig into those and you go, well, did you really do that? Mm. You know, like Donald Trump is a good example. You know, he, he claims that he started out with nothing but a million dollar bond from his father. You know, if I, if I started off with a million dollar bond from my father, I could probably do better than I have as well. But it's more than that, too. A another person that that's kind of in the media right now maybe not positively but um oh shoot i'm drawing a blank on her name now the she's a being indicted for fraud with the medical testing do you know who i'm talking about uh, is it no, M I can't think of emily it. no i have to look it up medical fraud i'm just gonna type in girl because i bet it brings it up medical fraud woman elizabeth holmes I know it would. And so so she's a, she's a classic university dropout. Um, develops this medical technology that makes blood testing so much better, blah, blah, blah. And and it turns out that she was just... she She's the youngest billionaire ever sort of thing, right? Or youngest female billionaire, multimillionaire. And turns out that she's just kind of defrauding everybody and her technology didn't really work. And uh, anyway, and so, every, you know, point everybody's pointing at her as a, oh, look at this. She built it up 
college graduate. But then you looked back into it and, and you go, okay, she got to the position that she was in. First of all, she was a, a Stanford dropout, Stanford Medical School dropout. So you're not talking about the local Rice Lake Community College <laughs> dropout. Everybody gets in here. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about somebody who has already either has connections or has proven themselves to be very intelligent, one of the two. So then you look, you know, I did a little bit of reading about her, and, and it's like, okay, she got all of these investors because she had family connections. And and so did you really make it on your own? I don't think so. Right. You know, for every every rags to riches story that is truly nobody knew this person and he fought his way to the top, 90% of the rags to riches stories are, well, yeah, you had some connections. You did put in a lot of work, I would grant you that, but, you know, it, 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 it lies through a lot of things like, like you and I, you know, we're, we're semi middle-aged white guys. We have, we have an, an amazing privilege versus a little black Muslim girl in South Africa or, you know, wherever. We have a tremendous, tremendous amount of advantage over over a lot of people. And, and some of those people out there are probably a lot smarter than both of us combined, but they will never have the opportunity to because of their circumstances. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I was actually... Um... The, the book that I was referring to earlier, Outliers, refers to not only when you were born or when you grew up or when you these these famous people, you know, accomplish these things, but then who were they surrounded by? Where did they live? What communities? What countries? Um, just because of there's just so many of those factors that can play into how someone can become great and it, it can just be just a small deviation and all of a sudden that person didn't make it and so yep. like like you say your circumstances is, is something um well, it's like um I, I just ran across a video the other day i watched do you know martin sheen oh yeah yeah so did you know that martin sheen and anthony hopkins they both grew up in the same town eh oh really yeah they're they're like the same town, and then I forget the I forget the guy before them, but he he's also as soon as as soon as I heard his name, I, was, I recognized. Oh yeah, he's a famous actor as well. But they, all three of these guys lived in the same town. That's wild. And and it's just like it's just a small little agricultural village in 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 England, but because of because of the connection suddenly you have this line of famous people come from that. You know, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's something to be said for who you know versus what you know. Right. Well, and you're welcome to obviously, you know, you can play me off here if we're, if we're getting long in the tooth here, but, and we can also save it for your after show, but I had one more question, um, just kind of, one more general thing that I find intrinsic valued and maybe North people uh, that I wanted to get your perspective on. So I'll leave it to you. Do you want to add one more piece to this puzzle or do you want to save it for the after show? No, let's go ahead. Okay, I'm, so uh, I'm enjoying the conversation. Are you enjoying the conversation? I, I am. I am. I, I, every time you, you, uh, you, you talk about this stuff, I love to, to, to glean as much as I can, but the, the piece that I'm interested in, is where do you feel that vis like visualization, um, meditation? Do you think that that has any part to play in achieving goals? And if so, how, mu how much? So going back to um, going back to the bucket of motivation earlier, uh, meditation has been shown to be one of those things that fills your bucket, essentially, right? Uh, being being present in the moment, and because number one, it takes away excuse me, it takes away that background uh, thought uh, that, that that's burning up some of your mental resources and it allows you to recharge, recharge or refill your bucket. Uh, visualization, that's, that's an interesting one because there's, uh, so there's, have you ever heard of mirror, mirror neurons before? I don't think so. 
All right. So in your brain, especially, especially when you're younger and more, and, and your brain is more developing, you have these neurons that are called mirror neurons, like mirror as in reflection, right? Yes. Yeah. And so what they are is, is they, uh, they fire when you see somebody do an action, like, like, like if I go like this with my hand, the mirror neurons in your head just, just fired. So for those, for those of you who are listening, since this is an audio podcast, I just opened my hand and closed my hand. And so Michael's mirror neurons did that exact same thing. So your brain visualized my action and closed my, and did the same thing. Mm. And so that's, and so there's a bunch of theories behind mirror neurons. They, they do help with motor development. So when you see somebody do a task and you see those mirror neurons are, are, are firing and ingraining that pattern in you to some extent. But then, so with, with visualization, those are, uh, they, that's how you visualize things as well as those mirror, mirror neurons also become active. And so you're, it, you you are training your brain without doing the physical thing and so there is some research out there that with with ballet dancing and martial arts are the ones that I ran across there's probably more but uh doing like visualizing the movement and firing activating those mirror neurons trains your brain in the activity that you're doing so you can it's it's not quite as effective as actually doing the activity because there is also like brain brain body brain muscle connections that need to be developed but it is actually a a way of of developing physical habits at least um and there is like visualization research of you know like I am powerful. I am, you know, I am woman and strong, whatever, yeah. those types of things too. There is research behind them saying that they are beneficial. It's like positive affirmations. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, like, those... I don't, I, I don't find myself ever sitting like in a room by myself with my legs crossed and like eyes closed meditating type of thing. But I do find myself thinking I, I mean, I put like stay away from my phone and I've just spent some time by myself in just like a quiet moment where I'm thinking about what do I want to achieve and how will I get there and why mm -hmm. do I want to do it? And I find that there's been at least, you know, a handful of times now, uh, the thing that I wanted or the thing that I was going to like, I thought like this is something that's going to be important in my life. I've gone out and been able to go get those things or to do those things. and you know, it, I just, I don't know. It's just, thought, it's always been interesting to me. It's not like, um, it's not a matrix thing. It's not like, uh, <laughs> you know, where, where you like all of a sudden you see it in the future, like, um, not an epiphany. What's, what do they call that when you, you see it? Like, um, you've seen it before. I'm drawing, I'm drawing um, a blank on it. Like deja vu. Deja vu. Or... There it is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. But it's, so it's not quite like that, but it's like, I can see where, where I want to go. Like I can see my coffee business being where I have employees and we're, you know, automating and it's, it's cranking out coffee. And, um, I, it's, I don't, so I just am interested in that piece and, and how important that is in someone's life that wants to, to go on and achieve big things. And I think that, yeah, based on what you're saying, it sounds like it, there's a piece to the puzzle there. Well, it, it, I think a lot of people, to your point about meditation, a lot of people think that if you're meditating, you have to sit with your you know, your thumb and your finger together, your eyes closed, your on, on your on your pillow or or wherever, right? Um, but in reality, when you're meditating, that those it's those. I mean, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that, and it's probably beneficial. But but the real power of it is those those moments of okay, stop, clear your mind, listen. Uh, I think there's, don't quote me on this. This isn't, this isn't quite confirmed science yet. This is kind of reading a bunch of different things into things. But when you have, uh, when your body's in a constant fight or flight 
state or you're in a high stress state, right? Our bodies evolved, designed, whatever your personal belief system is. Um, your, your systems are designed around fight or flight. And so when you're in a high stress situation, whether that's just being tired, whether there's lots of noise around, whether you've been working hard, whether somebody's yelling at you, whether somebody has a gun pointed at you, these are all high stress situations. Your inflammation is high. Your brain is, is focusing on, on external stimuli and, and trying to be situationally aware. So, you know, the right path to escape or attack. Whereas if you stop and you, and you take those moments and, and do like box breathing, for example, you know, like four second, breathe in four second, breathe out, hold your breath for four seconds, breathe in, blah, blah, blah. And just doing a few cycles of that and becoming aware of your situation that gives your brain time to, to process and go, okay, there are no threats. I can be calm. I can relax. And then, then you're, your higher thought processes take back over again and you begin to think of things. Uh, a good, a good thing that to remember is high, high emotions equals low intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's why you should never punish your kids when you're mad because you're probably wrong <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, like you should, you should, uh, stay out of the shop when you're angry because you're more likely to make a mistake because your, your intelligence is lower. For sure. But anyway, yeah, so that's my theory. Uh, and then I was going to say, kind of wrapping it all up, maybe one of my first episodes I did was uh, the Creative Cliff Illusion. I don't know if you remember listening to that at all or if you did. But uh, the Creative Cliff Illusion is this this cognitive mistake that everybody makes. We we assume that people that that your your creativity gets burnt out and then goes down, it decreases. And it's because when you're when you're brainstorming a bunch of ideas, right, you have a whole bunch of ideas right off the bat, and then you think of less and less and less and less. And so there's this cliff of creativity. When in actual fact it's not a creativity it's not a it's not a decrease of creativity what it is is a decrease of of just volume of ideas creativity is actually a long term reworking of of already understood and known ideas and so usually like you'll notice like when you stop and you're thinking you know, you're thinking about how you want your business to look, whether you're conscious of that being a, you, the idea that comes in, whether you're conscious of that idea showing up, that trains your brain in the background to be going, I'm going to look for this opportunity. And, and you're going to be more aware of the things that, that makes your vision come, come alive. Sure. That makes, that makes sense. I, I don't, I personally don't. So I'm, I am religious, like I, I do believe in God, but I don't believe I don't believe in 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 a magical God, I suppose, right? Who's gonna be or 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 the universe magic, whatever. If you don't believe in God and it's just the universe, universe manifesting your thing, I don't believe that that's a thing. Like I don't think that if you just sit and you think hard enough, it's going to happen. I think what's going on is you are you are training yourself to take advantages take advantage of opportunities that present themselves. Um, I think Thomas Edison is the one who said um, opportunities often people miss opportunity because it shows up in overalls and looks like work. Yeah. You know, and so there's, whereas if you're visualizing how you, how you want your business to be in the future, you're probably going to, you're probably going to see that guy in the overalls and go, ah, no, that's, that's the direction we want to go. And you're going to be willing to put in that work 
versus if you're just you're going to miss those things if you're if you're not paying attention to them and i think that's where the power of manifestation comes in i don't think it's magically changing the universe and aligning your chakras and the stars or anything like that i think it's just purely your brain and your motivation is becoming more aligned and more focused and so you're more aware of the opportunities that come along sure huh i like it hatch i got an idea Let's get, uh, you read us out, but I got a couple more things for the after show. We'll get, we'll, we'll get a little more of that, uh, Patreon action for you here, but we'll see how many people dive in after we, after we get, we sign off on this. This sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> thank, so, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on and taking the time. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap up. Thank you everybody for listening and, uh, we'll head on over to the after show. Oh, I guess I should really say, why don't you tell everybody where you can be found before we sign off, Michael? Oh, fair. Uh, so if you're looking for the content that I put out, uh, there's most, if it has to do with the Oak and Steel podcast, I run the Oak and Steel podcast on Facebook and Instagram, um, but I'm always tagging Matt in it because to be honest, and I know you were hoping that you'd get a little little uh, Steel on Oak violence today, but Matt's Matt's the true star of the show. I'm just there to be the first person to see it. Um, but otherwise, if you're looking for the coffee roasting that I do, it's it's MoundsViewRoasters.com is the website, and they also have Instagram and Facebook. But uh, yeah, that's those. That's how you get a hold of me. Sounds good. Now I'll be honest. I don't drink coffee, and so I'm probably never going to plug your product or buy any. But uh, I will definitely link it in the description, nonetheless. That's all right. I appreciate it. That's a, and and uh, Sullivan's been on my case about uh, trying to get him some up there, and it's like, buddy, the coffee to get to you is going to be like three times what it would cost to for anybody else in the world. So I don't know if you <laughs> want to do that. Yep. All right. Signing off and heading over to the after show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So if you found anything from this episode to be helpful and you want to reinforce it for yourself, I'd like to invite you to share it with a friend in the next 24 hours. That'll help reinforce it in your mind and it'll help those around you, which is always a good thing. So thanks again for listening. And now I'd like to say thank you to all the amazing patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast. You guys make the show possible. If you're finding the show helpful and you want to support it, there are a few tiers, including a simple $1 a month option to just say thanks. For $5 a month, you can get access to the patrons-only feed that has a pre-show and a post-show, in addition to the regular podcast all-in-one feed. You all know that the good stuff happens after the official mics are off, right? If you can't support financially, I totally understand but I'd love it if you left a five-star review or told a friend about the podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear that as well. Send it to questions at workshoptherapypodcast.com and I'll get it on the show. I want to say thank you to all the patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast, but especially to the founding fathers. And they are Mr. Matthew Serio from Argiano Serio, Mr. Brad Harrison of Brad's Customs, Mr. Keith Drennan of Blackthorn Concepts, Mr. Eric Peterson of Overall Maker Works, Mr. Brandon Millichamp of Tectonic Creations, and the one and only the Grant Alexander. So a special thank you to the founding fathers and thank you to everybody who supports and shares the Workshop Therapy Podcast.